let, let's get started. Okay, it's it's five after official time, and um, okay. so uh, welcome everybody back to our um, uh, first Fridays for October after a um, a long summer break, and uh, um, we want to welcome John Hayes Eitzen, who's a cellist and he teaches at the um, Cornell University, but he's also an inventor, and uh, so he showed some of the work he's been doing with three D cello printing. 3D printed cello bridges at our um, acoustics workshop at Oberlin this summer. But uh, um, he's going to, I think, give a, a bit more comprehensive overview and um, some, hopefully some results of the experiments he's done and experiences with 3D printed cello bridges. So, John. Hi, thanks for having me and hello, everyone. Uh, so, I've done all kinds of work. This is, you know, many people have attempted to 3D print cello bridges or violin bridges or any other kind of bridge. And it, it's never really been taken too seriously because if you look on YouTube, you see, you know, high school kids, you know, different people with a skateboard in one hand and a 3D printer in the other. And, and um, in fact, one of the things that kind of inspired me to get going on this experiment was I was looking around to see who's 3D printing cello bridges or violin bridges. And, and I discovered it was what drew me to meet David Perry, who's a guest here with us. He's one of the pioneers of 3D printed instruments. He's, he's a Cornell grad, I'm pleased to say, go Cornell. Um, and uh, I didn't know him when he was here, but now he, for a number of years, he's run his own uh, company, Open I don't know how you say it, openfabpdx.com, openfabpdx.com. It's an open source violin printing company. And he makes all kinds of wacky instruments that he sells to alternative musicians everywhere. Lots to, you know, rock musicians. Some of them have LED lighted fingerboards and predominantly they're, um, well, he can tell you about that, but he's a very interesting guy with very interesting projects and a, and a great um, social media platform for discussing this kind of technology. Um, and then uh, Don Corson, who we met, actually Dave, David and Don knew each other through David's platform. Don uh, has been enjoying his retirement as a Swiss engineer, um, making excellent 3D printed violins. And, and he will talk to you about that. Um, something different about what I've done from, from what they've done is that, of course, they're making, you know, 3D printed violins and then and many most makers of these alternative instruments um, actually use wooden bridges because the bridge is such a critical component and they want to it's a small part and they just think well I'm going to get the best possible transmission of sound into this box whatever the box is and um, and then you know we'll go from there so we don't want to complicate it with a 3d printed bridge however my take is the exact opposite. I want to deal to learn more about the materials involved and the processes involved by taking an instrument that I know very well. His his name is Bruiser, and it's an instrument that I have played on for for years, many many concerts. An instrument that I know intimately, and um, I wanted to try three D printing bridges, and I wasn't sure what I was going to encounter. Uh, the first thing I did was ex go right to the top and, ex and, and experiment with some of the, the, the very most advanced technologies, um, SLS and, and multi-jet fusion, there, which are closely related, basically, um, where there is a, a, a fine powder, usually of nylon, um, and this powder is sintered with a laser or a combination of laser and heat and, and, and fluids. And, and, and so then you're left with basically a solid mass. And this kind of printing offers often the best stability between the X, Y, and Z axes. You get all, something that's almost as solid as, a, as an, injection mold, an injection molded part. Um, and it's something that I trust have trusted for making prototypes of all types and even some um, finished commercial products that, that uh, have been sold for some years now through my company, saddlerider.com, Saddle Rider Music. Um, and so I experimented, I, I got some of these prototype bridges back. And of course I knew because the, the these materials, I'm in a new office and it has a very aggressive uh, power control button that turns the lights off when I 
and stable. Anyway, um, so these uh, materials tend to be a little more flexible and heavier than wood. So if you just print a solid, you know, HP multi-jet fusion bridge, copying a violin bridge, it's going to be somewhere in the order of twice as heavy and much more flexible than the violin bridge. And it'll sound quite dull and dead and it won't sound good. So the only way around this is to start dealing with the architecture, try to find ways of making it hollow and making it, it stiff and light and, and just sort of to have any hope of approaching the sound of a wooden violin bridge. And, and I tried this, I tried all kinds of things. And the challenge with this type of printing is that the, the powder needs to be evacuated. You have to make holes in the design. So you have to intricately you know, work things out. And, and it, even if you make holes, it, it's easy to make a design where the powder doesn't evacuate well out the hole that you've designed in. And I just was, try as I might, I wound up with bridges that sounded better than I feared, but worse than I hoped. And they were just not usable bridges. And I was just on the verge of giving up when I thought, well, I'm going to take some of these low end, you know, commercial uh, commercial 3D printers that are FDM printers. Uh, fused deposition modeling, I believe, if I'm getting that acronym right. Um, and they operate as, there are high-end FDM printers and there are quite affordable and expensive FDM printers, um, but they have like a little nozzle that ex extrudes melted plastic of many different sorts onto a, a matrix that is sort of like weaving layers of this plastic um, and it solidifies. So the, the, the great thing is it's very easy to understand and easy to maintain. And people make these from kits, high school kids put them together from, you know, $200 Chinese kits purchased off of Amazon. Um, but the problem is that because you're layering layers on top of one another, you tend to wind up with an X axis that is prone to breaking apart. So the, I mean, sorry, a Z axis that's prone to breaking apart. The X and Y axes are much stronger than the Z axis. So this is a problem if you're making many sorts of instrument components. The new, the new printers are getting better and the new filaments are, are getting to the point that you can do lots with them, but it's still, there's always this nagging question, what's going to happen to the Z-axis uh, when, when it gets really uh, you know, under, under load, under duress in, in the trial of the moment. Um, but one thing that I, I realized with with FDM is that it's really the perfect mechanism for making bridges because bridges are essentially almost two dimensional. So all of the areas where they need the most strength, they have them on the X and Y axis. You make the bridge laying down, bridges tend to be flat, perfectly perpendicular to the body of the instrument on the bottom. So that's what is the first layer. And you get this perfectly almost mirror like first layer. And then gradually as the angled portion of the bridge slopes up, you get little tiny stepwise ridges, which you'll see in some of our examples, but it's still very strong. You know, you so so where the bridge is weak, it isn't a, a direction that tends to be a problem. And so it actually works really well. But what's even better about FDM for making bridges is that by virtue of the what they call the slicer software, which is the software that takes uh, a CAD generated file and um, slices it up and get, and generates what they call the G code, which is the code that actually tells the, the CNC or the 3D printer what to do, exactly the motions to do. And, and um, this, this slicer software, especially some of the very good shareware software like the Prusa series, Prusa Slicer, which is available for free, um, does an algorithmically wonderful job of designing hollow spots in these bridges, a little like a honeycomb affair. So whether you're making 100% infill, which would be solid, or working all the way down to 15% infill, which is what I use in most of my bridges for the best acoustical results, um, it's uh, the, the, the computer can do what would be incredibly arduous for us to do on our own. And what's more is that you can take um, what they call modifiers in this software. So you can take a, a bridge and you can say the whole thing is going to be 15% infill, but here's a trouble spot, here's a trouble spot. And I want to uh, make it so that a luthier can cut down the feet a little bit. So I might make 
a few millimeters down here that are solid and a few millimeters up. So you can take these modifiers and specify different infills at different spots. So it's a fairly simple way to, again, automatically create quite complex relationships of infills. Um, that's a journey onto itself. And, and every time I've tried it, I found I wound up with something acoustically that I didn't like as much as a simple uniform approach, but I still feel there's a lot of, pro a lot of promise there um, as we do more research with it. Um, but, you know, people ask, why have I been interested in this project? And I have to say it's the, the hammer and the nail approaches. I'm not a, I'm not a, a luthier, I'm a cellist. And yet I'm very interested in, in the components related to the cello. I, I'm, I haven't been had the time to think about making an actual cello, but, but making components and trying to get the most out of the instrument I have that way, um, I've done quite a bit with. And of course now, because I've immersed myself in, in CAD and 3D printing, every, you know, every problem that I see, uh, it looks like a solution for a 3D printer and, and bridges are no different. They're a great way to use this technology. And, um, and so uh, you might ask how long it takes me to make a bridge. I would say, um, yes, uh, well, I'm J Dave, David just asked me, would he like to share the slicer? And yes, we'll get to that um, because in just a minute here, I wanna quickly move into an, the actual process, making a bridge. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna do a screen share here. Um, so let me just see, I guess first I'll start the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't wanna mess something up here. Uh, Okay. okay, now I'm gonna do a screen share and I'll show you the process of making a bridge. Oh, one thing to mention is, well, this is the problem. I, the, the zoom controls are in the way. How do I get rid of that? Goodness, I can't get the thing down. Well, I can just reach the button. Okay, what you'll find is that there's this, uh, the, the bar with all of um, our names on it, you're gonna wanna reduce that probably because there will come a time when there are keys to the bridges in the upper right-hand corner and that will block it. So I'm gonna go ahead and reduce it now or just get it out of the way. For in the beginning, it won't matter. So how to make a 3D printed cello bridge. I'm going to go fast. Um, maybe you can text or tell me if I'm going too quickly, I'll be able to answer questions. First thing you do, of course, is, uh, jack up the bridge on a on a bridge jack, which is behind this piece of cardboard, and put a piece of cardboard in this case, a piece of a of a U USPS priority box on the top of the cello, and trace the arc of it. Um, then you cut that off with the scissors. You create a little um, snake of clay, put it, embed it in the corrugated cardboard um, edge, and cover it with saran wrap. Um, press it down onto the arc so you're getting a good mold of the arc don't forget to mark the center point here that's important for reasons you'll see in a bit um, and then when you put this on a scanner you scan it and of course now you can see you scanned the back part where you've also marked the middle which is important um, and then you import this into some sort of uh, a graphics software i like adobe photoshop or similar software you import it in you also take a bridge and you scan the flat backside, the part of the bridge that's facing the tail piece when it's on the instrument, scan it. Um, now this is actually a photograph. Uh, this is deceptive because it's not really a scan. I realize now I put this in as an image of a bridge, but it's not a scan because you can see it's not head on. A head on scan won't show this edging. I just saw that glitch, um, but you can change the opacity of the bridge so that you can move it around in front of whatever template. Now, this would be the same if you were using, let's say you wanted to start with an Aubert bridge blank that you know very well, you would just trace that and you would move it. And so that you're, however you wanna position it on the arc of the instrument. You'll have to move this and rotate it with the transparency until you get it lined up exactly how you want it. Um, and then when you do that, you, in the software, you cut it into three pieces. The idea being that you can combine these three layers using the, the different opacities 
in the Photoshop program, you can combine them. And I always leave the heart visible so that you can use that as a gauge to line up things and get the right. So whoops, went to. So then when you can see the layers lined up, you can line them up like this. And, and you can basically make yourself a template. Now, of course, you might, depending on what you want to do, you might want to push these two pieces a little bit inward so that it'll allow for spread and rotate them. I've found that a one degree rotation inward on both of these and a one millimeter closer, pushing them in one millimeter, winds up with feet on the bridge that fit really well when, when they're under load, uh, just like you would uh, fit the feet of a bridge by spreading them. Um, so then you take this template that you've made, you import it, you can see the template. This is an actual screenshot of, of something in, in a CAD program. And I use Autodesk Inventor, which is free to educators and students and, and costs anyone else something to the tune of $2,600 a month to rent. You can rent, uh, you can subscribe to Fusion 360, which is a very similar program by the same company, but it's less expensive and it's a strictly a cloud program. But anyway, you once it's in the software, you can trace it using the sketch tool and extrude it, and then you extrude from the side. Basically, you're just creating these extrusions that are almost like making your own little planes. It's a great way to cut bridges without cutting your fingers if you're a cellist. So then once you do that, you export a step file. Now, this is the slicer that I was talking about. This is an image from the slicer. And the the Prusa slicer. Now, if you zoom in here, you can see this is the computer gener generated infill. It has these little tiny layers that go this way and that way. And it basically almost is this corkscrew support that's very strong. And these are the various layers of uh, top coat. And these are the steps because there's a slope on this side of the bridge. Of course, the back is perfectly flat. But um, so that's how it the, the, the slicer program. You can see this, this one is a 25% infill. So 15% would look almost the same. There are just a little bit larger spaces between these, but not. it doesn't look very different. Um, so then when you have that, you export the G code. It's all very, it's, it looks very intimidating, but it's actually quite easy. You drag an STP file, you drop it here, and whoosh, the software pretty much takes care of the rest. In its simplest form, you can do almost nothing. But if you want to add, this is the stage at which you can add the modifiers before you slice it. You can, it creates geometrical shapes or you can draw your own so that you could put, say, a cylinder here, a cylinder here, so you get solid parts or, or higher density parts at certain stress points so you can change the stiffness. Although, as you probably know, most of the structure, whoops, what did I just do here? Ah, let's get back. Um, most of the structure in a in something like this, most of the the the, the stiffness comes from the outer shell, just like an I beam uh, in in building a house. You know that the, they have uh, beams that don't need to be solid because the strength is in the shape of an eye from a profile. And the same, it's slightly different, but but so so if you try to bend a fifteen percent infill bridge and a solid bridge, it's remarkable how close the stiffness is. There's not much difference at all. Here's the printer in action. You can get a sense of the size from looking at the, the bridge. This is the sort of Prusa. Prusa is a, a company that has um, open source printers. I, I think it's uh, probably the best source of cheap, um, you know, inexpensive printers. This printer, a kit is might maybe four hundred dollars, and if you get one that's um, partially assembled, it's maybe five hundred dollars. There, uh, Joseph Prusa is the founder of the company. They're based in the Czech Republic, um, and the far the the filament we're using here. You can see I'm, I did this in <laughs> in my humid basement. I didn't have the humidifier cranked up enough, so there's a little bit of ghosting here. But that doesn't. That's just basically when the layer when the print head jumps a gap and trails a little hair, it, but it doesn't hurt the, the, I've not found any problems with the prints. You just wipe it off when you're done and it's it's no problem. Um, but the um, the filament we're using is a, is a carbon fiber infused um, PLA, polylactic acid, which is basically a, a, a corn sugar plastic. It's very benign stuff with little particles of carbon fiber that each particle is, is uh, about 15 hundredths of a millimeter 
long and maybe one one hundredth of a millimeter in diameter, or maybe even five thousandths of a millimeter in diameter. So they're longer than they are wide, but they're still quite short. Um, they sort of interlace on each other and, and give added stiffness to the part. So the final step is that you put a little cardboard box over this bridge and you turn the heat bed up. In this case, you can see I've done it to 98 degrees centigrade and walk away. And a half an hour later, the printer says, I'm turning you off because I'm turning myself off because it's I've been active inactive for half an hour. So it just happens to work out perfectly to be a really good time, a really good duration to anneal a bridge. And we, we maybe um, maybe David Perry might talk about what annealing is uh, when when he you meet him in a little bit. So the, then finally you get this bridge. You can see some of the ghosting I didn't clean out, but but uh, you take a an emery board that's flexible and just lightly buff off the bottom, making sure there's no residue or little little burr that sticks out so you don't scratch your, your varnish. And that is how you make a bridge. You can see even with no fitting, you get a, a really quite an excellent fit. Um, and, and then I found, you know, the bridges that I was making this summer at Oberlin did spread a little over time. And I'd find, you know, because I wasn't taking into consideration that extra springing, but with these, with the stiffer material, and the um, and bringing them in a millimeter and rotating them about a degree on each foot, I find that they they fit well and they stay fitting well over time. That they just spring out to a certain port point and then they don't really spring further. So now, before I go on, I don't want to get into the acoustical part of this. Uh, you know, I don't want to really talk about the response of the different bridges until whoever has access to headphones has listened to the video homework that I gave you. It's a four minute video, not quite ready to go there. I'm going to uh, show you one other thing first. I'll continue this um, in a little while, continue that presentation, but I'd like to show you just because we were talking about, well, how do I get rid of this control on the top? I unfortunately put, Okay, I, I put icons behind the control on the, the Zoom control and now they're disappearing. I just want to show you a fun little video, not video about um, a, 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 a something, what happens to the bridges under stress. Now, one of the issues with, um, with PLA bridges is the heat sensitivity. They're great at room temperature, acoustically great, materially great, but as they start heating up, you can uh, start running into problems. So um, I wanted to test this heat resistant protopasta brand of, of uh, filament that, that David Perry introduced me to. And um, so I'll show you in a moment what happens when you heat up. Okay, so I've got okay, two bridges here. Um, in and of, and I was doing it in 20 minute increments. Later on, I got into a phone conversation and cranked it way up. So this is a regular uh, Prusament PLA. It's a very high grade, but it's just a base PLA uh, filament. Um, the appearance with the sparkles is just a cosmetic thing. They ran out of the black. This is a carbon fiber and PLA composite. It's about 10% of the carbon fiber materials. The rest is, is the PLA. Um, the print settings, are pretty similar. So at 175, nothing happens. In this particular case, at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, the the um, regular PLA started to droop under the under its own weight. I was surprised, but of course that I wasn't that surprised. I knew that that was an issue. Um, but you notice the carbon fiber stays completely sound. Nothing happened. You go to 225. Interestingly. Um, the regular PLA didn't, I expected it to just kind of keep drooping until it fell down to the side. It didn't happen. It just kind of stayed the same. In fact, um, it almost got less of a warp, but that is because you can see there's shrinking. Shrinking is much more of an issue um, in with regular PLA. Now, this is high temperature PLA. Um, I One of the tests that I intend to do, I have the materials to do it and haven't yet done it, is to um, subject the, the high temperature version of this PLA that is not infused with the carbon fiber to see if it shrinks less than regular PLA or if it do, is more subjected, subject, uh, um, is more likely to shrink. But you can see that because of the heat, this has shrunken quite a bit 
sort of like putting Crocs on the dashboard of a hot car when you go to the beach. You'll lose quite a bit of size to the point that if you if you anneal a regular PLA bridge, you wind up with something that you're not going to want to put on your instrument because although the arching may stay the same, it's going to be too low by a millimeter or so. Whereas annealing a carbon fiber, this particular brand of carbon fiber, um, it doesn't have any problem with, with uh, or at least the shrinkage is so so subtle that I wasn't able to notice a difference. And you can see it's still perfectly flat, no discernible. So up to 275, it's still, the PLA is still holding on. I, I presume that because of the shrinkage, it might've been getting a little lateral support and it just wasn't getting, it was almost almost less warped than it was, but the the, the regular PLA, um, the carbon fiber PLA is still not warped. 300, you start to see just a tiny, tiny little question of warping, but that's, I did get involved in a, call, a phone call and forgot to take these out of the oven. So 60 minutes later, it's still holding up well. At 325, boom, the regular PL, uh, PLA melts and the carbon fiber still isn't even warped. At 350, I've just, just working with the carbon fiber, still not warped. At 375, catastrophic failure. So that's what happens under heat. Of course, if we were putting these under load, I'm sure that the hotter it gets, the more it's likely to, to warp under load. But I just was checking out the, the bare basics of under its own weight, what would happen. And that's that. Um, so I'm going to stop the screen share now. And um, before we go to the charts, um, well, maybe this would be a good time to introduce uh, Don and and David, um, just who might say a few words about who they are, what they do. Um, and I'm not sure if George has appeared yet or not. Uh, one of our friends, he, George is still not not here. Okay, I'm not. He might be. He's in a different time zone, so he might not. He might be putting the kids to bed or something. Um, so uh, yeah. So David, can I pass? things to you to introduce yourself, talk a little about what you do, maybe pick up anything that I might have missed in this part of the presentation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so hey, everybody, my name is David Perry. Um, I run a small product design firm in Portland, Oregon, uh, called Open Fab PDX. Um, typically, I make money designing other people's products. Um, it's much easier, I'm sure many of you know, to make money not making violins. Um, when I don't have client work, though, I like to make violins on my 3D printer, and I've iterated them enough now that they are good enough, um, in particular for gigging electric violinists. Um, so, yeah, one of the big, uh, oh, cats, man. Anytime I'm on a meeting, just I become cat furniture. Um, one of the big problems I have had to solve with my instruments is that resistance to heat, because if you're a gigging player, and you're at a wedding, you're going to be out in the sun. You might need to leave your instrument in the car. Ruby, this is very disruptive. Come on. So yes, that has been um, something I have focused on a great deal. Um, and I've also enjoyed exploring um, different design methods. So there's something called generative design, which you know takes uh, uses an algorithm to take your mechanical constraints, your loads, and whatnot to kind of grow material in a certain way. Um, yeah, so right now um, I am mostly making money making these 3D printed instruments. Um, again, mostly electric instruments, uh, along with a few kind of weird custom things. I've got a, a strange um, viola da gamba behind me. It's the upside down one um, for a player in, um, in Singapore. So I get to make all these interesting th things. Um, and yeah, I'll go ahead and, and pass to Don and we can talk more later. But um, John, I feel like you covered things. Do you have, can, can I just say, do you yeah. have that generative bridge? That, do you have an image of maybe when Don is talking? Sure. I, yeah. I think people would be interested to see this was a what an, an AI bridge using what was it topographical generative design or yeah. something? So I'll go ahead and, and just share this screen here. So the generative bridge looks something like this. So is this the, now which which CAD software decided that that's what a violin bridge should look like? So this is in Autodesk Fusion 360. And yeah, it's um, I kind of gave it you can see the things that look a little more forced. I gave it feet. I gave it this profile at the top. 
Um, I used a, a starting shape that's very similar to Don's bridge design, which looks more or less like uh, this. And then the computer grew this support structure that would basically hold up to the load I told it to. Um, and you get a very efficient use of material. So it's- uh, that, sounds, that sounds terrible, is that right? No, this one sounds pretty good. Um, oh, okay. The first one I ever made, and this was, gosh, many years ago now, was this. Uh, and I'm sure many of you can see this and say, wow, that's going to sound terrible because it's just like a straight rigid line to the instrument. And yes, it sounds very unpleasant. Um, now, if you had like a resonator and you're in a bluegrass band, like I could maybe see that kind of tone working for you. But generally speaking, it's it's not good. Um, but with this one, the it's almost like the the shape is there such that you get the right mechanical filtering and amplification of the right frequencies. Um, and then the generative portion is more optimizing material placement and less determining the um, resonant structure of the bridge. Yeah, so I'm happy to talk more about that if there are questions. Um, it's really fun, it's fun to play with. Um, yeah, and you get cool looking stuff. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Don. Don, you can introduce yourself. Don, you are muted. Don. Well, hold on, Don, you're muted. There you go. Okay. You hear me now? You're a bit okay. on the quiet side. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm an, actually an electrical engineer, and I've been doing this uh, 3D printing for quite a while, while uh, making clocks. And at some point, being a violist, I said, uh, what happens if uh, I could make, is it possible for me to make an instrument? And I saw David's- Don, uh, is it possible uh, for you to turn up your microphone volume? Okay. Or just talk closer into the mic, yeah. move it physically closer to you. Hey, uh, does it sound better? Mm, it's about Not the same. Really it's loud. <laughs> okay, then I'll just get a little closer. But um, my, I started out um, trying to make an acoustic instrument. I didn't want to make a, a, an electric instrument. And what I discovered is actually making a, a full-size instrument in plastic, it turns out to be heavier. And it needs trying to find ways to, to make a sound like a normal instrument. I discovered that the bridge is the really the most important thing. And I ended up with a bridge that looks completely different to a, a, a standard bridge. Because I'm trying to, I'm forcing more high frequencies into the into the body. And this much more flexible body is is turning it into a sound that sounds really sounds like a violin. Um, David, do you have on your computer uh, um, my bridge? Yeah, I have something at least very share? similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or your your version of my bridge. Yeah, and you, you'll see that it's 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 quite different than a than a standard bridge. Yeah, and if we compare it to something more or less standard, is this? Yes, and the the thing that makes the big difference is reducing the weight. So I've done everything possible to reduce the weight. Yeah. And, can, and I just, with... can I interject something here? Just, yeah. uh, just to, so what you're pointing out, and I just wanted to make sure everybody's noticing this, is that that you guys, you violinists, are doing sort of the opposite of what I'm doing, and that you're taking 
a bridge and making it really, really different because you're dealing with these instrument bodies that are so extremely different from wood. So you're really focusing exactly. on the, you're, exactly. you're trying to crank it up. But what I, I was really impressed by those 40 odd iterations of bridges that looked exact, almost exactly the same that you had made. And I don't know if you have that graphic or the, the I, ring. I, but I don't that, have that, it with me now. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that it was, that is one of the great things about this technology is that you can just do tiny iterative changes and really see how things evolve. So anyway, back to you, sorry and to the, interrupt. The, the, the thing is with this 3D printing, I spend much more time making the models on the computer than I do printing. It takes 15 minutes to, to print a bridge. So it can do a couple a day. And it, it really then trying things out and finding which parts that need to be changed to get a better sound. And in the meantime, I would say the sound is, is very good. The only problem is the the projection of the instrument. It's not as loud. It should be. It must be louder. On the other hand, the instruments that I've sold have because people wanted instruments that weren't as loud, so they could practice practice at home. Well, in the meantime, you. in the meantime, I'm sort of frustrated because I think the my I'm hit, hitting a wall because the material properties are just not not that what we need. I need a plastic that is stiffer. Tone wood is so tr incredibly light and stiff and there's no plastics around that are, that are like that. And uh, so, and I think I've gotten to the end of optimizing the bridge. Everything I try now is worse than my, my best. So uh, it's sort of frustrating at this point. <laughs> Thanks, Don. And, and I'm going to come back to you when we start talking about the material properties of the bridge, because you have that wonderful chart, the, 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 the graph of the materials to show just how different wood and these plastics are. Um, but so I'm wondering if this might be a good time. It's it's we have 20 minutes until we're going to come back and talk to Tom Nania of Didario, who has kindly helped me do um He's kindly helped me do acoustical uh, uh, bridge admittance tests with his impact hammer um, over in Farmingdale, New Jersey at the just amazing, amazing Daddario factory and plant, their offices. Um, but before we go into that, I have a like a very quick layperson's overview, and then we'll go to him for more detail of those graphs. But I wonder if we could take a, a like a five minute break to give everyone who wants to get a cup of coffee or whatever to do it, but anyone who has access to headphones and who hasn't yet listened um, to the video, the, the, it's a it's basically an audio video, a video without much video. It's just, just the audio recordings of, of eight takes, four samples of, of different music each with uh, in samples of wooden bridges, samples of, of various densities of, of PLA carbon fiber bridges. Um, please listen, um, because I don't want to start talking about stuff and then have people listen. Let's listen first and then talk about what you heard with the actual graphs. John, um, yes. Can you tell us in the video, one thing that might be helpful is how many wooden and printed bridges per set? Okay. All right. So I purposefully didn't do that. That's a whole conversation. Okay. 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 I purposefully didn't. Okay. I'll give you the, 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 the easy. So the, this is the tip. This makes it a little easier. There's one wooden bridge in each set of four. Okay. All the rest are printed. So this should make it a lot easier. And I didn't do that at first because again, I wanted to see what people came up with on their own, but this will make it a lot easier. So anybody who had questions the first time through, Let's see if we can all know what the wooden bridge is. And, and if you want to pop me an email or message or whatever, or just make a mental note of it, um, this should make it a lot easier. Okay, so um, we're going to take a five minute break. And, and, uh, and you... those, of us who, who have, those of us who have already listened, because we've done our homework, we can <laughs> chat socially with everybody else. <laughs> Go into the hallway and do your break. Do, do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And and use headphones. You know. Is there a way to mute Zoom so that it we can hear the other? I think um Do I have to turn off Zoom? I don't oh, I see, see him. 
If everyone's silent on Zoom, then we can listen. But if people are talking on Zoom, then oh, okay. Yeah. So no more, no more uh, socializing. We'll all be well. If I guess I'm fan. If you just mute everyone, then we'll be good.
Did we resume? All right. So now that everyone, or hopefully everyone who has the capability of a sound system that will make it worthwhile has listened, and you can make uh, a mental note of, of what you thought you heard. Um, and, and it might have been easier knowing that there was just one wooden bridge in each set. Um, I will say, though, there's one, I want to do one quick, well, I'll go back to screen sharing because I'm going to do a very quick overview and a quick chat about the frequency response of these different bridges, um, why I chose what I did, why did I play in a church, why did I play in a church instead of a dry room, um, and, well, I, there are a couple of reasons for that. One big reasons was switching platforms. I had intentions of making this a much more involved video with different acoustics, different microphones, switching, toggling before, and I just couldn't get it done. But I think it's just as well because that would have been a video that was long enough that most people wouldn't have had time to listen. So this was a good start. But but at the end of the day, what I was fine, I was actually concerned that in a dry room, it might favor the, the uh, 3D printed bridges in a way it might make them sound better than the wooden bridges in, in a sort of an acoustically brittle room. Um, and I wanted to choose something that was more of an, an accurate representation of the kinds of places we play in concerts and also where this is the kind of place the cellists record the box suites. So if you listen to any famous recording of the box suites, chances are it'll have an acoustic sort of like what you just heard in my recording. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go back to screen sharing and start talking about the chart a little bit. And Tom Nania, who I hope is here somewhere, I can't see him, but I'm assuming he's here, is going to go into depth. Um, into depth. So I'll give sort of a superficial, a superficial musician's lay overview, and then go from there. But before I do, um, where's the share share screen? Here it is. Okay. Okay, before I do, I just wanted to show you, so some people might wonder, how can you put a bridge like that on your cello, especially a carbon fiber bridge that's stiffer and maybe more pr prone to catastrophic failure? This is one of the things that I was was worried about. But when I tested these bridges, even with fairly, um, fairly very light infill, you tend to get warning before they break. You can see, you know, if, a if you're using a bridge and it looks like that, whether it's wood or plastic or whatever, you're going to take it off your cello. Um, you're not going to use it. Or if you put a bridge on and it looks like that, just when you tighten up the strings, you know it's not good news. But one difference between regular PLA and the carbon fiber infused PLA that I was expecting to be just the opposite. I was expecting the carbon fiber to explode catastrophically because of its increased stiffness and the PLA to kind of hold together a little bit. It was just the opposite. The PLA stretched a little more, but when it blew up, it blew into three pieces and to opposite ends of the room. The carbon fiber, presumably because of the tiny little particulate connections between the layers, particularly after they're annealed, um, it was more likely to crack, leave a crack, but sort of stay in one piece. And they can still explode, don't get me wrong, but it was a little different than the regular PLA. So I was pleased to see that and, and definitely, so Don, David and I have all come to the conclusion that compared to polycarbonate, PETG, many of the other filaments that, that this carbon, you know, high, especially high temperature, once you anneal at high temperature PLA with a carbon uh, fiber uh, particles in it, that that's the way to go for bridges. So anyway, now I'll get to back to the other. Um... If I can throw in a, a, a word. Sure. Um, I have just, I have seen in the, in bridges I've been making, some of the bridges I made were very light and none of them broke. But the, I've seen like after a week that they deformed, but but nothing happened that was catastrophic, even on very light, very thin uh, bridges. That's good to know. Um, David, you said that you've had one bridge on a, on a violin for five years now. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, one of the Hardanger fiddles behind me has been strung up and under tension for about five years. Um, that bridge hasn't failed. It did break a tailpiece, but that bridge hasn't failed. So, so you pointed out to me an interesting fact that when you have catastrophic failures, it's likely to be the tail. So that's, that's 
good to know. Anyway, that is my experience. That's, yeah. that's also my experience. The only piece that I've really broken un under attention was was the tailpiece. Okay. All right. So now on to the charts. Okay. So the first whoops, the first test we did was. Um, taking, putting, a, one of the, of course, challenges, you every time you put a bridge back on an, a cello, it's very hard to get the the tension on the feet because they they spread different amounts. You know, I so, so whenever I put a bridge on, I have to sort of tap the feet up and down, sort of spread them out, spread them till I, till I can get the, the feeling that the bridge is doing what it wants to do. It's where exactly where it should be and it's doing what it wants to do. And, but to get exactly the same sound, you can't just, put a bridge on the cello and expect it to sound the same as the last time you put the same bridge in the cello. It takes a few seconds of tweaking, even for somebody who's done it hundreds of times, like me. But so I wanted to see what happened when I reset the same bridge three times. So this is what we're calling the margin of error. You can see pretty good, not too far, a couple, what is it? Well, there's like a four decibel up, up here, uh, you know, around 1600, 1500 hertz. Um, but but still, it's a pretty pretty consistent. Uh, and then there may be anomalies here. But but Tom, Tom can talk about that. So then the next thing we did is we took clones, essentially a clone of a wooden of a wooden bridge um, with differing degrees of infill. You may wonder why is it so little infill? Because uh, as I said, you know it just seems to sound better to my ears as you get later and later infill i've gone to 10 percent, but when it's at 10 percent, i start to get a little concerned about you know damn it 15 percent seems to hold up well but um but tom from my, one of the things that i was interested in now what anything you heard in the video were it was all they were all copies of the wooden bridges i did of the wooden bridge because um the wooden bridge that you heard i'll go ahead and say it but let's keep it between ourselves here the second bridge in each of the four takes was my favorite wooden bridge, the one that I've played many recordings and many concerts with. It's my favorite. The other three, um, I take it back. Two of the others were the same bridge, having been taken off and put back on, um, probably not getting in exactly the same spot, and, despite trying. And the other was, so two were 15%, one was 20%, and I didn't include the 25% because I just didn't like it as much. One of the things that I was interested in was why, uh, my feeling is as you get denser and denser infill, the bridge gets a little deader. It it um, doesn't seem to respond. I mean, it's still good, but it just, the, the, the lighter weight infill bridges have, have a greater um, liveliness to feel under the bow. And yet, when you look up here in the higher ranges, and it, 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 the, this effect gets even greater as you go into the higher ranges still that maybe Tom will show us or not, you see like a 25% infill up here around 1400 hertz, you start to, it starts to split the difference between the green wood um, and the, the lighter bridges. So I was thinking, why is it that it looks like the, the higher range is getting better, but it feels duller? And I realized that if you look, say, here in right in the middle prime cello range, you know, the A string, you can see so clearly the stepping from 25%, 20%, 15% wood. It's just so clear, these, these what is it, a couple of decibel notches. Um, between in this peak and not exactly the same thing over here, but something like it. Many of these peaks have absolutely clear notches from 25, 20, 15 wood. So it makes it perfectly clear that in the playing range of the cello, which is from about 60 some hertz to like 800. Now keep in mind right here where my arrow is pointing, this is the extreme high end of the cello. That doesn't mean the cello gets there. That means Playing, we're mostly performing down here. You know, this is the A string, you get, you know, up above the A string, but then you start getting into the stratosphere up here. And this is, we rarely play that high, just in, in the wailing in a concerto somewhere. But then up here, it just, it, you just don't play that high. So you can see that when I selected these bridges, I knew that they weren't going to be as consistently sounding like a, a, a wooden bridge as some of the more modified changes. But I wanted to just show, this is what a copy, you know, this is what the basic shape will do in the different materials. And it is actually as different as these are in this range. It's kind of amazing in my view that just making a copy and making it cellular 
can get to my ears as close as it is in the cello range, uh, not even having to change the design. Now, if I had used regular PLA, like at Oberlin this summer, there's no way it would just be you, a, a, a bridge that looked like this made out of regular PLA would be almost unusable because it would be just too flexible. But when you start to use the the um, infu the the carbon reinforced composite, it's amazing how close it is to it. It is not as stiff, but it starts to feel when you squeeze the feet together, when you just, just sort of a tactile test, it's remarkable how similar it is to maple. And, it, and in fact, this is a little bit deceptive because this particular photo, the, the, the bridge that I used in the recordings, it was supposed to, I, I made a clone of this bridge, which it was the middle of summer. That's what I was using. And then when the weather changed, I had to switch to a bridge that was a millimeter higher. So I just raised the height of these, but I didn't change the thickness of the feet. So that so the, the this wooden bridge is actually structurally a little bit stiffer than these. So so I'm not sure to what extent you're hearing that, seeing that in the chart. But and of course that will be a test for another time. So there, I say it's a clone, but they're really not quite clones because this, the wooden bridge is a slightly stiffer shape because the, these legs, although they were supposed to be an exact copy of the Milo bridge, they, it came out a little different, which is again presenting the issue that comes up. If I want to compare features with these um, bridges, I can change one thing and have everything and know that I'm getting exactly the same thing. But when I try to make a wood bridge or have someone make a wood bridge that is exactly like another wood bridge, I've just it's incredibly hard to do, as you probably all know. As uh, Luthier. John? Yes. Um, so what are the masses for those bridges? You'll you'll exactly. see it. That's, that's my question. You'll you'll we're gonna get there. Okay. They get later. I'll, it's the next page. Okay. So the, I'm now I'm gonna get now into the phase where where Tom is gonna take over and I'll let him he he probably will have his own chart so he can control them, but but you can see now you start dealing with different shapes. So you steal it with a, a direct copy. These are all, in this chart, they're all 15% infill. But so I go from a copy or an almost copy, as I said, then take out what I'm calling the uvula. I don't know if that is, I don't know what the name for this is, but take that out and you can see what changes there. Then take out the uvula, take off the wings, but leave the feet and everything else exactly the same. Now this bridge, Tom says it, he thinks it looks most like the wooden bridge. And, and this is, that's another story, but I, I decided not to use this one in the test because, again, I wanted to demonstrate physical, um, you know, the, the differences between the materials, not by doing some completely different thing. And then this, I don't know if Guyan Amrim is out there, but he <laughs> must have been dismayed when he brought his family's flagship bridge. And I, the next morning at the Oberlin uh, Con workshop, said, hey, Guyan, how about this? and showed him a plastic copy. Um, I apologize for that sacrilege, but it's still been very interesting and it's a very, very compelling shape as you can see from what happens to the same. So this and this are absolutely identical, just the shape of the legs. And you can see just what it does. It, it becomes a quite different beast. Um, and as far as the mass is, here they are. So the the 15% infill, the wood, they're virtually exactly the same, or sorry, 25%, uh, which is shown in the chart. I didn't play it. Whoops. Um, it's shown in the chart, but I didn't play it, but you can see the, the frequency response almost exactly the same. Then they just get lighter and lighter and lighter, all the way down to 12.9 grams, significantly lighter. Um, my experience is the lighter you get, it does tend to sound more agile when you agile, but when you get to a certain mass, then you start to lose density in the sound. I mean, then there's a certain point at which it sounds resonant, but but a little lightweight, and and you need to add some infill back. So that's my experience. So that's basically a superficial. I, I, I'm going to make this whole presentation with the charts and everything available as a PDF in in a blog post. And now I'm going to stop the share, and pass it on to uh, to Tom, to talk more about those charts. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. So 
and uh, Evan and, and Jim Woodhouse, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, just wanted to discuss the uh, measurement setup. It was a uh, accelerometer attached to the base corner of the bridge and uh, PCB impulse hammer tapping at that same location uh, in the direction of the of Boeing. And I think John did a great job of summarizing the data. I think what's most interesting to look at is this chart here and just seeing when you get to this uh, maroon colored trace where you remove the wings from the bridge, to me, it starts to uh, resemble the wooden bridge in this bandwidth between about 1,000 to 5,000 hertz. Um, and it just sort of speaks to the fact that if you want to make a 3D printed bridge that behaves like a wooden bridge, uh, you would redefine its geometry, which um, David had spoke to earlier as well. And again, looking at the Amarim bridge, uh, that's very rigid, almost has like a an A shape to it. And you just see the increased activity at the at this high frequency bandwidth, um, it'd be compelling to compare a wooden uh, marine bridge with 3D printed versions. Uh, but I think what most resembles the wooden bridge is that uh, maroon color trace, which is the bridge without the wings. You are getting rid of that extra uh, mass that's, that's uh, that functions differently, I think, for a different material uh, when you're comparing wood to these 3D printed bridges. Um, but uh, if anybody else would like to uh, give insights to these charts, please do. That's sort of my uh, big takeaway, the 30,000 foot uh, takeaway. It's a very interesting project. So I appreciate being a part of it. So thank you, John. Oh, you. Can I just check with you whether the strings are damped there? There are these very narrow dips at low frequency, which look a bit like string resonances, but they may be after length resonances. The the strings and the after length uh, was damped. It is a uh, carbon fiber tailpiece. I'm not sure if that uh, is a factor, but the strings were damped on both sides okay. of the bridge. Thanks. So, um, uh, can I, can I, yeah, I think uh, we're in the I, question, I think we're in the question phase now. Yeah. So, um, yes. All right. Well, just, uh, formally, you know, thank you very much, um, John and, uh, David and, um, oh, I forgot, um, Don, Don. and Don and, 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 and Tom, thank you very much for the, uh, for, um, your insights and, and all the work that you've done. So thank you very much. Um, so let's, uh, go to the Q and A and, and please use the, uh, the raise hands function so we can, uh, you know, so I can coordinate everybody. So Colin. Um, uh, very interesting talk indeed. Um, uh, may, may just one, well, two comments. The first one, one refers to the playing range of the cello. Of course, those are the notes on the, the music you play, the frequencies that you actually hear are uh, all the harmonics of those uh, of those notes, which extends right up into that um, uh, kilohertz range in just the same way that a violin. So th that range is incredibly important in terms of the brilliance and excitement of the sound of an instrument. And what you've shown is is that the different bridges make really quite a lot of difference. Uh, uh, low, uh, at, at low frequencies, the bridges relatively a rigid body um and um and, and it's less less sensitive on the violin and it will also be on the cello um <clears throat> but uh, the very interesting bridge the anomalous one with the a shape is it, very interesting because it really boosts in the brightness sort of area the the sound and it may actually be a major breakthrough in bridge design because it will make the cello sound an even more exciting instrument 
than it already is. I, I yeah. personally <laughs> believe that the cello is the greatest of all the instruments because it, ha it, it's, it, it, it produces sound over this hugely extensive range. Um, um, but the other thing I am surprised that um, when I do measurements on a cello, um, um, I don't see those um, very strong peaks um, that Jim was talking about. And it does suggest to me that although they may have been damped, they haven't been damped very well. Um, but it would be interesting to know where they're coming from because um, when I do measurements on a cello, um, in my measurements, I don't see, I, I see a very simple structure without any, any peaks like that. Just to, that's the comment. I, I didn't, Tom, it was using what looked like a good foam. It would be very easy to 3D print a damper that would flex snake-like through the strings and would would damp them solidly, I guess. Um, but then, of course, we might get harmonics or something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, I, Tom, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> uh, it, the, the strings looked damp. They seemed damped, but maybe we could have used a, a harder foam. I don't know. This is all kind of new to me, the, the um, admittance testing. Was um, it on both, both sides of the bridge? Did you damp it? No. Um, um, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, it was damped on both sides of the bridge, but maybe we should have... Uh, put a card or done more damping uh, up the neck or uh, not to create a a node, but um, we could have probably done a little more to damp the strings. But wh whereabouts are you putting your damper? It, I would say it's about two inches up from either side of the bridge. Uh, okay. and it was just foam okay. stuck in between the strings. Yeah. But I mean, the, I, the, the cello strings are very heavy, of course. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you need really quite a lot of dampening. And um, uh, I mean, I, one of the ways to get damping is to have an exchange of energy and the damping um, with the end of the fingerboard. And um, it doesn't, you know, if you do measurements um, with, the, with the, the phone dampers at the end of the fingerboard and compare it then with and without, you see the background virtually not changed whatsoever um, uh, with just the um, uh, loss of the, the damping. It is change, does change things a little, but very little indeed. If you have the dampers too far away from the end of the the um, uh, bridge right down towards the nut end, you start to getting some very interesting effects and extra resonances. But I don't think it's those. Those are very sharp resonances. And the only thing on the violin body that has sharp resonances like that are the strings. So that's not a criticism of the measurements because it is a measurement um, as uh, in a sense, much more as it is played. And the really interesting thing I see from those measurements is the huge um, changes at the high frequency end, where the mass of the bridge is important, as Jim will tell you. Well, I hope this isn't the last time we do this, uh, Tom. I will, will try to damp more in the future. <laughs> Hopefully it's just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. All right, Joseph? Um, well, for, uh, thank you again, um, John, and 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 um, um, I'm so glad to see you doing this, and I'm especially glad to see this kind of innovative work being done by musicians. Um, and it'll hopefully help shake us makers away from our kind of overly wood centric vision of things, as though some special properties of the wood are doing some things to the sound. Um, this, I think, encourages us to think that there's a lot of ways of getting at sound and what the differences are, um, it's, it's not just a matter of, are you using wood or not? Um, um, that said, I, I, I second what um, what Colin was saying about the frequency range. John, you were implying that we don't play outside that, where the important I, part I'm is- I'm very aware that, the, that the, the sound is made up of 
of overtones and that's just right uh, yeah that that i didn't i don't think that so if i imply if i somehow presented that as what my i, I don't think that um okay, but good. i do however think that acoustically you know when you you work i was working of course without testing these without without the the, the benefit of the fft chart and i was just working by ears and i was working very quickly so one thing that was interesting when i heard don say oh you can make a couple of bridges in a day I can make a couple of bridges before breakfast. Once you get the things, once you get it done, it takes a few minutes to make the change in the graph. You take it down, put it in the put it, push the button, go have a cup of coffee, and an hour or an hour and 20 minutes later, you get it done. Then you put the cardboard box on, press the button for another half an hour. And and these I I must have made almost all these bridges, um, plus many more in the last two weeks because I was doing some other projects, didn't have time to prepare. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, it's a hugely iterative, very quick process for making pointed changes to the structure of a bridge and sort of seeing what will happen. Um, but um, one of the reasons I decided to use the, the shape I did was because I was working in a small room in my house. I arrived at something I was going to use, a bridge that looked very much like the one that Tom said sounds most like the cello, um, like a regular wooden bridge, it, because that's sort of to my ear where I was. I was just sort of evolving, saying, OK, I think I'm going to go with this one primarily. But then when I got it into my studio where I am now on Cornell's campus, it's a new I have boxes everywhere. I'm just moving in and it's a bigger space. And and I found that it was bright in this acoustic. It, it sounded too, it sounded good, but I thought too different from the wooden bridges um, even though the chart, maybe it wasn't exactly like, you know, it's hard to keep track of the iterations, but I decided, look, I'm just going to go with the same architecture, understanding that it's duller up high, but the meat and potatoes of the cello sound will be very similar. And I think that those, those audio recordings sound an awful lot alike, you know, I mean, based, based on the results of hearing people talk. Yes, it's true. The two wooden takes, the, the B, the B samples um, are the greatest. Okay, so the, the question I was going to ask, I agree with what you're saying, but um, the graphs showed what I would expect to show from varying the mass of the bridge, which I've done enormous numbers of times with different wooden models. You see, as in your first one, the wood bridge, which was apparently the lightest, had by far more high frequencies. And in an area where our ear is most sensitive, it was rather similar in the playing range, but we'd expect that if they're about equal mass because it's below the presumably below the the first mode of the cello bridge i don't know what that is um and so if to me to, to be convinced that two bridges are identical i don't care about the shape i want to know that the the distribution of mass and the resonant frequencies are the same did you measure the resonant frequencies i i remember that we had a conversation about this or exchange and we talked mm -hmm. about this and I tried to do it and I had minimal success because of the, my skills. And I have subsequently forgotten what I was supposed to do. So the answer is mm. no, I didn't test okay. it. But I would like to. However, one thing that I have, uh, you know, I certainly hear what you're saying. And in my experience, I mean, in the test, all, all the bridges that were in the recording were lighter than, than the wooden bridge, some significantly lighter and, 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 and frequently very similar bridges, which way, so the resonance is that's something else, but the mass, you know, it totally depends on the design and the infill, you know, you can, I mean, that that was, that's something for future tests where you can, it's very easy to change at a half a gram by making it 5% more infill or less. And so you can see what's the design and what's the density of the material itself. What, what's, so what we're not seeing in that case is the stiffness of the material. Which will certainly also make a big difference in its its resonant frequency. So, um, my my interest as someone interested in bridges is what difference specifically does the material make? I, I I mean, it's easy from experimenting with wood to know what differences the mass makes and the resonances, but what difference does the material make? This would be really good insight in order to discover that. I mean, one thing is you can measure the material properties, but the other is to measure the, you know, essentially a modal analysis of the bridge, something I, I, I haven't done, but people like George Stepani do 
Um, and with a cello bridge, that's quite easy to do. And then um, is is the damping different at high frequencies? Things where you might expect it to provide a, a quality difference. Um, that's um, what these showed. I think it is. I mean, the, the biggest difference that I could see is that the that the the printed bridges are very similar um, in the fundamental up until you know through the playing range of the cello. But then when you get into the overtone series, they're it dro they drop off. But then when you get higher in the overtone series with the big graphs, again, I wasn't sure. I didn't understand this, but if I remember, they pick back up. Um, but that was there were some questions to whether that had something to do with the testing itself or the mechanism involved, whether it wasn't related to the actual sound of the bridge. Um, but but I think if I had to just I mean, it's it's it seems to be more damping in the higher frequency. Yes, that seems to be. So you have to design a bridge that is going to sound brighter. It would be too bright if it were wood, mm -hmm. but it might sound very much like a wooden bridge if it's 3D printed. So yeah. but I'd actually be surprised if it was higher damping in high frequencies. I don't know. Um, Fan, you know something about these polymers. I mean, in strings, they work incredibly well at high frequencies. It's, they're not damped. Um, can you say anything about uh, or does it vary really, so much I from one uh, to the next? I, I think uh, first, uh, before you even ask that question, is um, um, and this is a question for you know people like um, Jim and Evan, which is that in the bridge, um, how much um, does the damping affect the transfer function, you know, from the strings to the instrument body? Yeah, so rather little, I would think. Yeah, rather uh, little because nearly all the damping of the actual bridge resonances is, is um, energy leaking through the feet into the body. Mm -hmm. the, the internal dissipation of the material is relatively minor. Interesting. So you're saying that, generally speaking, even with wooden bridges, that the damping isn't going to matter that much? Oh, um, my guess is that in terms of physical measurements, it will be a small effect, but I'm being very careful <laughs> yeah. always okay. that the small effects may may still matter to players mm -hmm. uh, for sure um mm -hmm. that's you can only test that by doing the kind of study that you're doing here which which is lots and lots of bridges and swapping and playing them but but it's it wouldn't be my the first thing i'd look for okay which is encouraging then because um the other properties you know density and Tuning is much more easy to control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, anything else? Oh, Jim. Oh, let me take my hand down. Or Joseph. Um, oh, Anthony, Anthony. Okay, let's go to Anthony. Um, hi, John. Um, I was really. You mentioned the you uh, noted effects of uh, removal of the uvula. Um, but then didn't say anything about that. I just wondered what you could comment on that. When Tom and I looked at the charts, we are, are okay. When I was doing just the acoustic tests in the last couple of weeks, making these bridges, I thought I heard a difference, but in retrospect, I think it was really related to another. I tried to change one element at a time, but because of time constraints, sometimes I was changing multiple elements. I came to the conclusion that, oh, well, this sounds better. I'm going to keep the uvula out for my subsequent bridges. But when we looked at the chart where I simply took out the uvula, we noticed the difference was very slight. It was like one little peak. Maybe it was right in there. We noticed something, but I can't remember exactly where. Whereas removing the wings, of course, makes a huge difference. And it's not. it seemed to there is a lot more mass when you take out the wings. So um, that's a question for Tom. Tom, can you trace what the uvula did in the chart when we removed it? Uh, nothing really stood out. It, it, it's sort of, uh, I think you'd see as much variation just in measurement to measurement of the same bridge than you'd see any difference uh, with the uvula removed but we're also only looking up to 5k so maybe there's something at a higher frequency um, but nothing jumped out i would say uh, another question would relate to um th that sort of a frame shape of bridge that performed very like wooden um is, is a sort of a pattern that 
um, isn't that's what you'd kind of call what um, Starker developed as a bridge model with cutoff wings, right? No, it's actually extremely different from Starker's model. Starker, I never really like. He was my teacher. I never used one of those bridges. Um, he, they were kind of bulky blanks. They were basically a traditional blank. A tra and I trying to remember if they were French or they might have even been a traditional French shape. But but the the heart instead of a harp was some modified S was his trademark heart. But the big the biggest feature the the main the primary difference was that he had holes drilled upward in the legs, um, sort of you know con conical holes. So so a small drill bit with a larger drill bit followed by a larger one a larger one. And so most of the leg the lower portion of the leg was was hollow. That was his contribution. I'm not sure if he was the first one that did it, but he's the one who tried to sort of make a trademark out of it. And right. um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen players uh, using a cello bridge with cut-off wings that looks rather like your carbon yeah. fiber one and with a, with a big hole in the middle kind of thing. Or how many and, students have cellos with broken wings? I mean, I, I <laughs> well, broke it no, off. No, I mean, it this, others, but, this you know, is I, quite I, intentional as a, as a, uh, this was a, a principal cellist in an orchestra here. Um, but uh, I just wondered if how that design in wood compared with that design in printed as opposed to printed with wings and printed without wings. When I I've used wooden bridges like that, I've made them and I, you know, I, I mean, this is not some radical idea to take the wings off. I'm not nothing about these bridges. Is, I'm sure everything has been done before. It's just a question of how does it relate. And and in my experience with wooden bridges, when you take the winds off, the wings off, they tend to start to sound pretty nasal and pretty nasty. Um, and but but that's exactly the direction that you need to go with these 10% um, carbon fiber PLA bridges. Um, to make them sound more like a wooden bridge. It's just a different material. So so I think a wooden bridge, depending on other, but there might be other factors to change, which is what we're trying to learn here. What can you do? What alternative shapes can you make in wood? How will changes? So you can get the relative changes, you may not the, but not necessarily, you know, the, 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 the shapes won't be compatible with different materials, but you can get a sense of how things will change when you make those shape changes. Thanks. All right. Owen? Hello. Yep, go ahead. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. OK, so um, I, I was wondering, like, uh, do you notice any differences in terms of playability, like compared with uh, uh, the wood the wood bridge and the um, carbon fiber or whatever? Yeah. The, the 3D well, bridge? absolutely. Um, so I will say that Again, the recording I made, you can listen to it. It was it's at the very, very beginning of this, just because we're using the same shape and it's just these are the material differences. Um, in general, whether the bridge is heavy and dull or or light and bright, in general, the the printed bridges are definitely more consistent. I mean, they sound the same from low to high. It just there's this feeling that you're getting that there's a, it's a very homogenous kind of material in the same way that often I feel carbon fiber bows sound. I will say just anecdotally, I am not a fan of most carbon fiber bows. I have never performed a concert. I do own one that I think is a good one and I practice on it. But every time I'm I have friends and colleagues, even the concert master of the Philadelphia Orchestra who would play, you know, playing, oh, are you using your carbon fiber bow, you know? And he'd be using his carbon fiber bow in some chamber music or something. And and he does it, but I just find they kind of homogenize the sound. They don't, have, and so even, and I tried just dozens of bows and some big name carbon fiber bows at, at the fiddler shop where, you know, they've been very supportive of my work. And, and I was down there doing a, a presentation and went through all their um, carbon fiber bows. And what I found is that 
the wooden bows, whether they were good or bad, tended to be more interesting. And what I would say is a more interesting sound. Sometimes they had they were really problematic in terms of the way they felt, the way they handled. And yes, the carbon fiber bows could be more consistent, um, but I just didn't. So I'm not somebody who likes carbon fiber. I but I will say that that I feel like just from what I've done so far, it seems like there's real potential with bridges to be less different from a wooden bridge than most carbon fiber bridge bows are different from a carbon from a wooden bow. So I, that's been an interesting thing. But if there is a one sort of a, a generality, I would say that these 3D printed bridges tend to be a little more homogenous and a little easier to play. Um, less likely, for instance, if you hear, if you listen just to the first scale, the A and B takes are very, very similar. The first clip of the C major suite and then the second clip of the C major suite. I like the second one better. Um, it's wood, um, but they're very close. And I do notice that the second one, like the A string will jump out or there'll be these little inconsistencies that make it maybe interesting, but also a little more unwieldy and 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 these extremely consistent materials that that it just so i would say maybe easier to play yeah and if i can jump in uh i would agree john in, in my experience um you know if the entire instrument is 3d put in the experience is similar where um you know maybe you do lack a little bit in what kinds of tone or dynamics you can generate from the instrument but in general making it sound good is easier um I did a more comprehensive comparison on bridges on my wooden instrument, nothing fancy, but my wooden fiddle. Um, and the experience was very similar where on the 3D printed bridges, things were tonally more consistent. It was easier to make an even steady tone. Whereas with a wooden bridge, it was, uh, I could do more with it, but it was also a little more challenging. So yeah, playability can increase depending on what you want out of the instrument. Uh, so John, um, your your friend George is on. I don't know if you wanted uh, him. To... George, well, I'll just say George is is uh, one of a kind. Here he is. Let me give a little brief introduction. Um, he's a, a carbon fiber wizard. He made the tailpiece. He earns his bread and butter making carbon fiber tailpieces. He made his he he the tailpiece I have in my cello was made in his shop in Kharkiv. Um, just before the bomb started falling and he managed to get to the West with his young family and now has managed, to, I mean, not to the West of Ukraine in the mountains, had a hard time opening his shop. Now he has managed to get to Poland where his shop is, he's once again making tailpieces, but he is somebody that, that is just an inspiring guy to talk to. He always feels very shy about his English, so I don't necessarily want to put him on the spot here but um but he just got to tell you so he made his 3d printer which he used to make his cnc machine which he used to make his his uh molds um to make his tail pieces and other things and he has just coming up with you know he in the 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 saddle rider research collective which we i call it you know it, it just several friends who we get together regularly and brainstorm and um david and and don are sort of were recently you know starting to you know they, they were working with them but but the george was there from the beginning and and um so i was hoping because of this talk about because of the carbon fiber included in the bridges i was hoping that he could be here for most of it but obviously he just arrived but anyway so hi george you're just catching the tail end of this meeting and uh, and and hopefully uh, you can be involved in the future um, but thanks so much for all of your great ideas and um, and the, your your continued innovations in string playing. And so glad you're safe in Poland now. And uh, thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, nice to meet you <laughs> all. <laughs> uh, I just uh, interrupted uh, your discussion, so I, I don't know what exactly it was about so i glad to listen <laughs> george right. uh, one of george's great things you know some uh, larry wilkie and i were 
racking our brains trying to figure out how to come up with a tailpiece with a really adjustable after length. And, and Larry pointed out George's idea, which was this carbon fiber tailpiece with sort of like a runway where there were little titanium rollers that you could roll them up and down on the string stops. And so you could even still use a fine tuner with it, but adjust the after length. And then mm -hmm. he has that. And so that's when I contacted, who is this guy? <laughs> He's a very smart guy. And that's when, when the, where the initial contact come from. But we've had, um, even though we've never met in person, we've become great online pals. So um, anyway, he has lots of great ideas and uh, his, his company is concarbo.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, George, even if it's a little uh, late. Um, so, um, Joseph. Um, yes, John, um, y y your uh, um, approach is, is very interesting. Take a cello you know well and find what bridges do to it. Um, what is your what is your end game? Do you want to make bridges that can be used for other instruments, in which case, how easy is it to tune a carbon fiber bridge? I mean, with, it's hard. I know nylon and carbon fiber, it's quite hard to um, trim, fit, all that. It can be done. But um, so just tell me, what, what, are you, what do you want to do with this? What I want to do with this is get the conversation going and have lots of other people doing it and people getting Prusa minis. And, and I, oh, well, I applied for a grant to the VSA to see if the VSA will buy for me to give back to the VSA and to make publicly available a heated chamber uh, 3D printer it costs something like $2,000. It's a, the great thing about this thing is it allows um, uh, peak, P-E-E-K filaments, some very high grade medical like dental and, and orthopedic filaments that are incredibly strong and, and, and might or might not do different things than than what we can do with an unheated chamber. So this is basically it's like an oven, and so you can do very high temperature prints. Um, and and you know I've I've been thinking of buying one of these using Saddle Rider company funds. It's hard to justify because I have everything I need in my bank of Prusas. Um, so it's a little hard to justify, but if somebody were to get that on research spec with the hope that we could, you know, share it and ship it around and maybe Cornell could curate it in the library for people to sign out if they want to borrow it for a while, um, that I would love to do that. Um, my end game, th th all of you luthiers who might be thinking, oh no, another thing that, you know, artificial intelligence is just, I, there, I, I think it's, it, it, whether you make a bridge out of carbon fiber or wood, it, it is uh, an art and and it's not something, I have no, no thoughts that this is a commercially viable venture. Although, I mean, in some, on some level, yes, you could make a bridge and, and I could just make, you know, four millimeters of sol sol solid infill around the feet so that somebody could shape it. But that's the whole point of this project is to learn and to make to have each player have a map of their bridge so if they want to experiment with something for instance i saw well i won't share the bridge but you know somebody posted on the international cello forum on facebook this very outlandish looking bridge with a coptic cross and and of course everybody went bonkers and i looked at the thing and thought seriously is that going to sound good and he was trying to sell these blanks and and i thought very interesting. So I just went and modeled one and I haven't yet put it on my chill and I have a copy. I just sort of freehanded it and said, what's this going to sound like? It's sort of a cross between an Amarim and a, and a Belgian, but then it has some other added materials, which I think are mostly for cosmetic or not, but I'll at least be able to see how it sounds in comparison. And, and this all becomes very quick and easy because I have the height, I have the, the arch on the bridge, the sprint string spacing in the feet, it's all done. And what I do in between takes minutes, you know, um, and then I can go from there. So, so not too well, that, much. Yeah, the, the, well, that nicely sidesteps the problem working makers face, which is every instrument is different. So we, we can't, modeling it would be a very slow process. We need something where there's maybe wood stuck on the bottom so you could fit it or, or well, you know, something like that. I would like say that. this, I would say this. Um, so the, you, you saw the skills. You need to basically, you know, Photoshop, you know, a CAD program. And you have a basic understanding of how to take an STP file and put it into a 3D printer. 
uh, it's not like super advanced CAD, but it's, you know, I mean, you create planes, sort of slice things through, get a sense of how to cut. And then once you know that, it takes me about as long to make a 3D bridge model from scratch as it would take you to cut a violin bridge, I think. How long does it take you to cut a violin bridge? A couple um, hours? An hour? I mill bridges, especially so they're quick to fit. So fitting the feet is is nothing. Oh, new. so you <laughs> already have the cut. But if you were starting from scratch with a blank. That's oh, I there. wouldn't dream of doing that that's okay. i mean i don't know why makers do still i think there's general exodus from buying these um you know um ideas of what a bridge blank should be you know that these companies are making to have them make your bridge blank which saves an hour or two hours each time around yeah. um right so th that i don't you're absolutely right the amount of work traditional makers put into a bridge is is more or less work for works sake as far as i can see it's easy to sidestep without getting outside of wood a wood is actually cheap um it's it's a great material it's easily machined there's a lot of advantages it's biodegradable and like a lot of the, the the plastics so so um what interests me is what can you get from 3d printing and what can you get from plastics that you can't get from wood um for example wearing up of the top surface i imagine is a lot better with um you know, 3D printed, you, the, the strings aren't going to dig in, um, you know, so there's always advantages and, and disadvantages and it's good. And I'm delighted you're ex exploring them so we can know more. I'm curious to know though, as the last question, what do players think? I mean, would they try it if you demonstrate it or are they still um, resistant? I haven't, well, see, it, one, I have never broken, broken a bridge. Um, I am extremely reluctant to hand some 15% infill bridge that I've made to somebody with a half a million dollar cello and say, here, try this, or let me let me model this for your cello and give it to you. And it's like, you know, I, I trust it. I don't think, I think the risks are low. Everything I'm seeing is that this is fine. And when people see that I'm doing this on my prized instrument and I'm not worried, then hopefully other people will do it. And I'd be happy to create a model if somebody you know takes me an hour or two to to depending on what i'm or less i mean as i get better at it i could do this all these steps quicker and quicker i'm sure i could conceive of getting to the point where i can do everything in a half an hour you know to to basically model to get a model of somebody's violin viola or cello that they can just print whatever they do in between and then make it but i'm still at a phase where it would take me a couple of hours and and um you know, I, I certainly would be happy to to help people in that way get started. But it's more in a stage where, look, I've got a Cornell cello here. It's, hey, it's a good cello, but it's still a Cornell cello. Maybe I'll put one on there. A student, you know, I say, look, I'll give you this, but you have to understand this is pioneering stuff. And if it breaks or something, you know, so so that, that's a bit of a concern. But I just think I'm, I find it compelling, not just what you can do, but also the potential for sound. What you're hearing in the recording is a bare basic starting point of, of what these things can sound like. And and very few people, you know, even the people who can tell that's a little different, or this is this is the outlier, this is the wood bridge, this is the outlier. Usually they pick one of the 3D printed bridges that is the so-called outlier, and they group the wooden bridges with something else. Like even the most discerning people would say, I like two and four. And but they're not saying I like two is the best and then four is much worse. No, they're very, very similar. And this wasn't even this was just a clone, a 15 percent clone, you know. So so to to vary things very slightly, I just feel that I can totally conceive of getting a bridge that performs so much better than my best wooden bridge that I want to use it, even if there is some intrinsic thing in the wood that I like more but I'm still going to do a lot with this other bridge because it's louder. I can play dynamics better. I can get certain articulations better. It's more even it's, you know, I can envision that. Um, okay. One thing, I think you could, I think you'll find you could remove the possibility for catastrophe by adding on some either or printing holes through which you could put some carbon fiber tubes at strategic places or, or sticking on veneers on the outside. I mean, if you just look at the failure points and reinforce those, I think you'd have a lot of freedom to um, to do what yeah. you like. 
right. Anyway, I, good, but I, every time drawing. I've tried, every time I've tried something like that, it sounded worse. And and I I just I do think these things are pretty structurally consistent. I've broken a lot um, on purpose. I mean, never on, yeah. never accidentally, but on purpose, I break many many bridges. So well, so do my I clients. Saw Chris Dungy, <laughs> I saw wooden, Chris. <laughs> sorry, yeah, wooden no. bridges break too. So you know you're not alone in that. Anyway, Chris. Yeah, Chris. Chris. Dungy. Yeah, you had your hand up. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, oh, I bet your fan wants to turn this off. No, no, no. Um, no. <laughs> thank you for your presentation, John. So just to clarify, um, I listened to the samples in a different way. Um, but am I correct in that bridge 1B and bridge 2B were both wooden bridges? They were they were both my favorite wooden bridge. Everything else was three D printed. Okay, all right. Um, they were the brightest sounding. They had the most happening in the high end because we can see that it, because the clone shape is the most likely to roll off in the high right. end. But and the in the lower frequencies, it sounds maybe maybe most like a wooden bridge. But then it is just a little dull, and I think you could hear that in those B samples. Yeah. Um, but. Um, but still, it's darn close. A lot of very, very discerning people. You know, right. I know people, and I know how good ears they have. And they I had weren't... to, I had to listen several times. Yeah. Probably took me, you know, close to twenty minutes. But I did listen on my iPhone, and after I listened enough times, I could start to hear the subtleties. Um, the first time through, it was like, you know, they all sound the same. But, you know, numerous times of listening had to take place. My other question is, um, two questions. What is your current cello? What do you play on? It's uh, Larry Wilkie made it. He's, okay. I, I used to play on his uncle's cello, David. Yeah, yeah. Perron, yeah, that's yeah. what I got the Philadelphia Orchestra with. At that time, some people were winning auditions with David's cellos. And I thought, well... I'll try it. And I started consistently winning auditions with it too. Right. But then when I wanted to record the box suites, I was looking for something different. And his nephew, Larry, um, had a cello that I thought would be a, a nice choice for that. And then I evolved from that cello into this current one, which I've had about five years. It's it's I, I call it bruiser because Larry antiqued it and it looks like it's been in too many barroom brawls. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it's uh, it's an instrument that I it's a it's a gefriller style cello. It has a, a complete one piece back with no seams. Um, right. And, and uh, of all of your bridge experiments, what bridge would you prefer to perform on in public? Well, I have. So I I all, I'm a guy who likes to have lots of bridges. I, I really and 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 I out after lots of bridges. One of Larry's um, the the bridge that came on the cello I think is a, an excellent one that he made. But it, but but then I had basically kind of clones of it made by uh, another friend who's an excellent luthier, and those so-called clones but of higher higher so that I could go through the seasons with them. But those clones came out sounding very similar, but, and only when I started doing this project uh, that I realized that the clones weren't really clones like that, which is why I explained that I copied the lower bridge, but then when I went, but then the weather changed, I was going to play on the higher, the mid, mid height bridge. I just stretched, stretched the model and only then realized that I, it wasn't really a clone that, 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 the the wooden bridge had slightly larger dimensions in some places than and so these 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 copied bridges were more flexible so that i'm sure i was losing some high end there because of the slightly increased flexibility so there are two things that i wanted to say based on what you said the first thing is you, you listened very carefully and then you could discern one thing that i hear and and i heard it at at um at the oberlin workshop this summer was it's very easy when we do these sort of listening tests and we say there's basically a random result. So we can say, you can't tell, it's just random. People are as good as guessing. And I have a strong bone to pick with that. I think the way to really know if something's random or not is to take the people who got most of the answers right, put them in a room 
and then test them again and again and again and to see because many of these things that might come off as random in a broad sampling might come off as highly identifiable when you're dealing with people that are really trained to listen in a certain way. I dare say because of the work you put in, you know now the sort of what's different, what's an outlier, what are the, I, I will, I'll try to trick you again next time as I make changes in 3D printed bridges and try to make a, you know, um, but, but I think that it's, you know, what I found when I was doing the tests with people this summer was that the same people would get all the answers right. You know, it's like some everybody else would be random and then one guy would get also, you know, the same people would do consistently very well. And and I think there's a lot to be learned from focusing on the people that are most trained in a specific area to see how they do in those tests. Sorry, Joseph has his hand raised. I just wanted to agree with that. Um, um, there is a um, fan who is the guy who wrote the book on loudspeakers? Uh, or Evan. Floyd Tool. Yeah, Lloyd Tool. He talks about that. Um, because they did a lot of blind testing of speakers and and he developed a lot of the science of that. And one of the things was, yes, trained, skilled listeners, you can get the results with much less people and much less time. So I absolutely second that. Um, but we have to separate that from the design of a test and what the point of a test is. If the point is, can anyone tell a difference? Well, then you want to know who, general audience. You know, um, if you want to, um, what you were doing, I, I think it was structured. I mean, Claudia would probably analyze it as a free categorization. Like we're not, we don't know what to look for. I wouldn't know what to look for, for, a. so we just want to find something different. And so if you set it up like that, where you listen to a bunch of things and try and, um, that, I mean, that's, that's one kind of test. There's all sorts of other ones, but I, I do agree that trained listeners are, are great if, if you can get them. And if you can, get, <laughs> you know, it's just so much work to get good answers. Um, but anyway, onward. The other point, this is unrelated. It's just a question for all you luthiers. One thing that really surprised me is I see what I'm calling the little knees or elbows on the legs, the little notches that go out. And I always thought it was just a decoration. And I thought, well, I'm gonna get rid of that. And then when I got rid of it, I could hear it. And I thought, whoa, that I, I thought it and I said it must be something to do with stiffness of the legs. And and I'm just curious, is there sort of a conventional wisdom around what those little points on the legs of a bridge do? Um, I'm sure makers have ideas. Sam was talking about it, I remember in one of his talks, and he thought once someone's string had slipped off and it caught on that. And so it, it maybe stopped it from being damaged. But I think most people agree that's aesthetic you you need a certain amount of gestures to bring the design together i am highly skeptical of it making a perceptible difference but if you can demonstrate in a blind test then 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 you're right i think it, it was it, pretty clear to me at least in the design that i had it was pretty clear and i think it has to do with by putting them there the structure is stiffer at that spot it's more material and and so i just chose to include them all because when I took them off, I didn't, I didn't like the way it sounded. And that was the only difference. One bridge was clearly different than the other. So um, I was surprised. That really surprised me, which is why I wondered if it was a thing for bridge makers, but it sounds like. Well, it's probably, I mean, it's almost certainly just added mass. It's going to be because it's so localized, you're not going to add stiffness over a big area. So if it's just the added mass in principle, you, you could, you could hear it. Um, I, um, I'm skeptical, but I'm willing to be convinced. Okay. I could see it almost like forcing a node. Like if you imagine that as a beam able to bend, and then you add a notch somewhere, you could sort of force a node along that beam, possibly. Um, just another idea. And I did have a question for this greater community, which is, you know, if, if we imagine a bridge that sounds different, or I don't want to use the word better because that's so open to interpretation, but like what would be an interesting quality to observe in a bridge that would be different? Like what would you want to see? Um, I'd be curious to hear any thoughts on that. Well, I have plenty, but I've been talking a lot. So anyone else got ideas? Well, I'm... I'm... I'm not going to really answer the question. I'm going to sort of avoid it, but um, 
but certainly in the violin world, it's it's clear that um, with different um, genres of music, you know, we have different bridges for them. We got you know baroque mm-hmm. bridges, um, got you know standard modern bridges, um, and those are the two most obvious examples. And um, and they they behave very differently. I mean, we've you know I've done a little work. Joseph's done a little work, you know, a couple of years ago, looking at um, frequency response to baroque bridges. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah. So, so the the bridge model is, um, especially as 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 demis or um, conceived by by Jim Woodhouse. I mean, it's it, it's affecting the treble range um, primarily, just because the, the you know the first the, the first mode is quite high in frequency range. Certainly, in the violin bridge, viola bridge. I mean, cello bridge is a little different. I, I'm not familiar with it, but with the violin bridge, it's it's absolutely a treble knob, and um, players vary a great deal about how much highs they want to hear under their ear. So I find that an invaluable tool for if someone's saying it's it's a little too harsh, a little too present, well, you can add weight to the top of the bridge or tune, you know, tune it. Um, um, but it's not, unfortunately, it's not a, um, with changing mass, it's, it's, um, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty, continuous changing tuning though is an optimization thing where it depends very much on the instrument where the you know the 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 island resonances and things that Colin has done a lot to make clearer it's it's a dance between the bridge and the island and so every instrument has its own island um but I, I I am quite convinced that it is the most significant element of the setup. I think you make much bigger difference to the frequency response with the bridge than you can with the sound post or even changing the top in, in, in my experience. Um, so I, I'm completely um, on board with all this bridge experimentation. I think it's 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 really where the exciting uh, area is for, you know, sort of makers meet players where you can actually feel like you're working on something that's important versus purfling stings or <laughs> a lot of the other things are, you know, we makers worry about. Uh, Colin? So I, I'd like to jump in here a little bit. Oh, oh. oh yeah, yeah. Evan, go Evan. Yeah, yeah I had my there. hand raised. Um, take it back a little bit and address what Joe's talking about here. Um, the active resonances in both the cello and violin bridge are affecting what an audio engineer would call the brightness domain. And that's that kind of north of one kilohertz type range. Um, that's what we're seeing in uh, the admittance data also, is that's where you're seeing the adjustment. Now, admittance isn't necessarily going to show up the same way in the radiated sound. And that's kind of a little bit of the disconnect on the on the physical side. But this is definitely in the range of brightness and on the instruments, they're all adjusting that frequency range, even though the size of the uh, instruments are different. So both in the cello and in the violin, it's that brightness domain. Um, and so I think it's, you know, I think you're all talking about the same thing. Um, one of the experiments you can do with something as simple as an audio filter is record your instrument and then jack around with the levels that are uh, just, uh, you know, 1,000 hertz to 3,000 hertz in that sort of neighborhood range and kind of have another way of uh, kind of playing with that sort of timbre change. Um, one of the things that's interesting on agreeing on words is brightness is one of the few words that people all have about the same idea of what it is. Um, you know, we get loudness, we get pitch, and we get brightness. And beyond that, we have a quagmire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Evan. Um, let's go to Colin. Yeah, I'll just, just comment um, on the um, the thing that we, the, the acoustics generally talk about the rocking frequencies of the bridge, which is the way that the top of the bridge, in fact, rocks backwards and forwards. Um, around its waist, and um, it's the resin, uh, it's the way in which it rocks, which, which is the thing that largely determines on the violin um, uh, the, the response in that area. And the two things that are important are the mass and and the rocking frequency, which you both those are both are measurable. In fact, and I'm, people have emphasised this all the way through. Um, uh, for the cello, for example, there's a the, the modes are rather different. The cello bridge from a violin bridge, because the feet are much longer, and it can and shear itself sideways as well as rock rocking on on its feet. 
and the two most important modes at any rate, what Kramer says in his textbook, um, and these are oh, very old measurements, are uh, one at about a thousand hertz, which is a shearing motion of the bridge, and another one, um, which is a, a just the top of the, uh, um, that's where its feet are moving, um, shearing backwards and forwards in the plane of the bridge. And the other one is a, a, is a rather more like the violin bridge, where it rocks backwards and forwards, and that's at about 2,000 hertz. Uh, but the things that determine that are essentially only two parameters, the mass and the rocking frequency. It's not quite the mass, actually, it's the moments of inertia, but we won't com we won't complicate that. It's the mass, because it does actually depend on the amount of mass that's above the waist as well, and the distribution of the design of the bridge itself. So, but primarily, if, if uh, it is, uh, as many people have been, emphasizing it's just this mass and the other thing is the rocking frequency the two things together determine the, actually the springiness as well but you only need two of those things and the two that are easiest to measure are mass and um the rocking frequency yeah yeah so Colin, i, I want to make a comment there because um you know about 10 over 10 years ago um um at the workshop and then chris dungy was part of this you know um they attempted to um um measure you know the rocking mode of cello bridges and 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 um and so one of the things they came up against is that you know for violin bridges it's for the, for the most part it's fairly easy to figure out what is the rocking mode frequency from the measurement but but it was very difficult for cello bridges because they found a whole bunch of other things around. I think you're you're basically touching upon this, and and so yeah. so I think um, at the time there was there were plans to do more measurements that we never followed through to try to understand better what all those modes were, so we can easier more easily um, quantify you know measure and determine what the rocking mode frequencies of a cello bridge was. Um, um, Jim. Jim. Yeah, uh, uh, I was going to comment on the same thing. I think the cello bridge is understood at about the same level that the violin bridge is understood, and it does have this extra mode. It's the one that uh, Colin was mentioning. And it is it is an extra mode. You could tune them independently. It, it depends on the stiffness of the legs mm -hmm. um, in a, rather than the bending stiffness of the waist. So it's perfectly possible with these 3D printed bridges that you could manipulate those separately. So the cello has, if the, if the violin has one bridge hill, a cello has two. If you include the upper hill in the violin, so it has two, then the cello has three. Um, you can infer those directly from a bridge admittance measurement. Um, and that's the cleanest way with the bridge on the instrument to characterize the things you're talking about. But it, it with cellos, it, it would be a mistake to concentrate too much on the rocking frequency. That, that's the second mode. Okay. The, 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 the lowest one is low enough that it's, it's, it's on the edge of what Evan was talking about. It, it's relatively low frequency. It's, it's round about where the transition hill comes on a violin. Um, so it's it's in a different place in our hearing range. So a cello bridge adjuster has another knob to turn. And that'll be part of the story of the, of the things we've heard about in this fascinating mm -hmm. talk today. OK, well, it, it, it sounds like uh, we need to um, pick off where we left off over 10 years ago to. Yeah. To, to you know measure cello bridges just to be more familiar with the mode so that we can more easily identify the modes. Read, read what I wrote in euphonics that there, there okay are some pictures of <laughs> All right, thank you Jim for cello bridges okay. and the and the extra hill okay Chris <laughs> I just, yeah I just want to jump in these are, these little knobs here if you if you uh balance the bridge this is right through the center of the way to the bridge so when we're talking about an item rolling around itself, you know, if we want to make it very efficient, we would want to have that weight here. If we reduce that, we take the rate weight and we put it up higher, changes the sound. Yeah. All right. Any other 
comments, questions? Well, All right, um, so let me just add one thing that I've been working intermittently with Sean Hardesty on um, bridge optimization, and he has software which he's eager to get um, to, to, to share where you can put a um, design in and it'll tell you the modes you put in the material with a, with a homogeneous or a, um, um, isotropic materials printable. It's, 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 it's easier. It's, it's quite, in fact, you could do it with fusion, but, um, and he can also um, show if you want to adjust one mode independently of another, where is the optimal place to add thickness? So he'd be a good person. To, um, and I, I, I'm hoping to work with them more in, in answering just these sort of questions, which, which really make things um, easier um, for the sort of things you're doing, John. What was that name again? Sean Hardesty. He's often shows up here. He he worked with um, Fan. He's a and his his field is optimization and um, yeah, computer optimization. He he wrote his own code um, to um, to optimize the shape for a target function. So so you know we we talked today about the uh, the built-in uh, optimization to optimize you know I guess the strength or you know the strength for a given amount of material. In Sean's case, what he wanted to do was to optimize the shape of let's say a violin for a target acoustic transfer function. And but but he can certainly confine it down to just the bridge part, you know. And so it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, I'll just I... feed in a note of warning there. Sorry, but before before you move on. Mm -hmm. Um, those kind of methods would not, without a lot of background effort, cope with this kind of composite construction that you're 3D printing, where you've got an yeah. outer skin and microstructure oh. inside. It's not obvious what the stiffness is. You know, it's it's not a homogeneous material, even in an, iso an isotropic one. So it would it would take you off on a bit of a tangent to do some characterizing mm -hmm. of, of how that composite structure actually behaves before you'd want to do any optimizing. Right, right, yeah. Okay. So let, yes. let's end the formal part right now since it's uh, uh, past three o'clock and, and thank um, um, all of the participants um, um, starting um, you know, with John and um, and David and Don and um, Tom. So thank you very much.